Good afternoon. I am very pleased to welcome Amartya Sen to Brown University. He is here to speak in the Watson Distinguished Speaker Series in partnership with the Brown India Initiative. Uh, I have to confess, it's a little intimidating to introduce Amartya Sen. I've, he's somebody I've known for a while, but am you know, constantly impressed with. He is a towering figure in his field and a person with astonishing intellectual range. Uh, as an economic theorist and a philosopher, he received a Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1999 in recognition of his work in social choice and welfare economics. As a development economist, he's conducted very important research in the measurement of poverty and inequality, and he's produced groundbreaking empirical analyses of the economics of famine, done great work in gender inequality. Much of this work I taught my own graduate students in development economics over many years, and I can say that his thinking in this area truly revolutionized the, the way people think in the field. As a public intellectual, in the very best sense of the term, he's been a leading voice on public discourse around individual freedoms, liberty, and fairness. And he's influenced the way we think about policy responses to poverty and human welfare and inequality. So, you know, when you put all these things together, I think the beauty of all of these different facets, facets of Amartya Sen's work in economic theory, philosophy, development economics, public policy, uh, the beauty of them is that they're all, really all of one piece. Uh, in his autobiographical sketch written at the time he received the Nobel Prize, he talks about his transition from the more theoretical work in social choice to the applied problems of inequality and poverty in the following way. Uh, quote, my own interest gradually shifted from the pure theory of social choice to more, quote, practical problems. But I could not have taken them on without having some confidence that the practical exercises to be undertaken were also foundationally secure. And you know, the result of his insistence on foundational security is that his insights on issues of immediate relevance to the world have an exceptional level of rigor and clarity of thought and depth uh, that gives everything he does just a, 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 a lot of um, credibility and, and, and uh, uh, make it have enormous impact. I would also say that through his own work, he essentially gave economists permission to think in a much more expansive way, but nevertheless rigorous way, about human welfare and how to analyze it and think about it. Uh, Marta Sen is currently the Thomas W. Lamont University Professor and Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard University. Uh, he has held positions at LSE, Oxford, the Delhi School of Economics, and visited any number of other places. Although he's lived and worked all over the world, his ties to India have remained very strong. He recently published a book with his co-author, Jean Drez, titled An Uncertain Glory, India and Its Contradictions. This book highlights and explores the paradox of very rapid economic growth that coincides with high poverty and poor educational health outcomes, especially among the poor, all in the world's largest democracy. His talk today is titled, Why is the Penalty of Inequality So High in India? So please join me in welcoming him to Brown. Thank you. Very, very delighted and privileged in being here. And it's wonderful to see the president. I've known Christina for a very long time and admired her work very much. We worked together for a while <laughs> also, and I was very privileged then. I feel um, uh, um, particularly sad that I got delayed today. <laughs> it was partly I left a little late, but and then there was a gigantic traffic and ending with also encountering a, a, an accident in front of us. 
which is, uh, you like to have accident behind you. <laughs> <laughs> that was um, unfortunate, so my apologies. And, uh, and of course I thank Asu for arranging, Asu Rosvashni for arranging this, this occasion and see many friends here. Well, I, you know, I think one of the problems about the, uh, the, the Indian uh, situation is this, that in many ways it looks peculiar that India should be a country with as much problem as we actually do have. Um, the, um, uh, it's a country which has been blessed with a successful uh, attempt at uh, democracy. In fact, it, important to recall that when India became a democracy uh, at the end of the time when the British left in 47 uh, they, there was a gigantic set of meetings going on in the Constituent Assembly which arrived at a democratic constitution uh, extraordinarily interesting a uh, lot of discussion about the shape of Indian democracy and uh, with the participation of some of the finest minds produced the democratic constitution. I was transiting from school to college at that time, and I remember viewing with some skepticism as to whether we would succeed, but we did. And yet something oddly has gone wrong in the sense that we look, if we look at the situation in India today, in many respects, it's really a, a kind of shocking situation with um, uh, um, uh, literacy, with, you know, still about a, um, a, a, a third of the, of the females and a, uh, and the, um, and, a, and, and a substantial proportion of the males still illiterate. Um, India having the highest ratio of undernourished kids in the world. The kind of debates about criteria of undernourishment, but no matter which way you measure it, it's very high. Um, immunization rate still uh, shockingly low, actually. If you look at the uh, uh, triple immunization, which should be quite easy to... Um, to deliver uh, is still only 72 percent of among the children, uh, and um, compared with China's 99 percent, uh, uh, Bangladesh is increasingly getting close to 90 percent. The oddity is, is that all this has been happening with um, fairly good performance in growth, which has declined very recently, and every time that happens. There are tremendous panic for those who tend to judge everything in terms of just economic growth, and we have predictively seeing that. But in this growth story, very peculiar. Sometimes it's missed how the growth story uh, began pretty early, because it's quite standard to say that India used to have very low economic growth. Certainly, it's too low economic growth in the sense that in the first couple of decades it was going at three and a half percent a year. Now three and a half percent a year of course is a kind of European dream today. <laughs> That's not a standard to go by. But you have to remember that the rate of growth of the Indian economy in the first half century, that is before independence, was um, less than one percent uh, per year. And in fact the per capita income was going at 0.1% a year. And compared with that, a 3.5% was quite a big jump indeed, immediately. But then it slowly went 4%, 5% by about the 80s, then the 90s, still only 5%, but it was very laying the basis of much further growth rate in the 90s and the, uh, sorry, in the late 90s and the, and the, and the, and the last decade. So, beginning from 92 to now, so it's now 20 years, there have been changes. India's um, income per capita is now about three or four times what it was then. 
in India. It's more than five and a half times what it was when India became independent. India was one of the poorest countries in the world and is still one of the poorest countries, but it's not because there haven't been any progress. And in the, uh, quite a lot of the last decade, India was the second fastest growing economy in the world, uh, large economy in the world, uh, following China, and at many stages it looked as if it was closing in on China, uh, China going at 9%, 10%, and India going 8, 8.5%. And a lot of people are really concerned about catching up with China in terms of growth rate. But of course, one of the peculiar things is that this is also a period when the Chinese went to universal literacy. They, they, they went fairly early. They, that happened actually before the economic reforms, that during even in the Maoist period. They were very concerned about literacy. That was one of the uh, actually communist commitments that they had. Also, a universal health care of a very low quality, but nevertheless universal coverage. And there China had a bit of a setback in the, in the immediately after reform. The Chinese used to be totally suspicious of the market economy, which didn't serve its economy well. And its agriculture was a chaos, real chaos. It's a uh, industries were uh, performing very much below uh, its ability. So when in 79 the reform came, the, um, that anti-market suspicion was drowned, and that was a victory for, for intelligent, open-minded planning. Uh, uh, and, um, but Chinese moved from a complete anti-market position to being completely pro-market position. So they marketized everything, including health insurance. And one jump, they moved from a position like Canada to a position like the United States, with a much lower level of income. And that, as you will recognize, was not an improvement. The result, of course, was the coverage fell from 100% to 10 to 12% between 79 and 81. And you see these in our, this book with Christina kind of mentioned that we discuss how much the Chinese progress in longevity slowed down. But then they recognized that things were going wrong. I was privileged to uh, be um, involved with the uh, Peking University. In fact, I still chair the, the, uh, the advisory, International Advisory Board of the uh, Development Institute of Peking University. And I saw with, I mean, many people in, in the university were quite upset about it. They wanted to go back to a universal coverage. But the battle took some time. But by about the, around 2000, it was quite clear that the critique was getting traction. And 2004, the Chinese decided to reverse it. And of course, in characteristic Chinese efficiency, they moved from there to near universal coverage in the course of about six or seven years. It has coverage of about 96, 97% now. Now, so, uh, but actually while Indians were talking about catching up on growth rate, there was very little talk about catching up with China in general. I mean, the Chinese had a life expectancy, which is um, uh, uh, 10 years longer than, than India's literacy rate close to 100%, with India's lagging behind medical coverage nearly 100%. Now, all that was happening while India was growing, and they were, I was surprised in some ways that it was continuing to go for so long because there were problems even then, and of course these problems have really come out more strongly now when people ask me, was I surprised that when in India growth rate slowed down? And I said, no, I, 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 I've not been, because uh, I was fearing this might happen, and it did. Well, what's, uh, let's postpone that story there. I want to come back to it as to what might have been go going wrong there. Um, the, but what's, uh, just forget China now, just think about India. So here's the economy growing fast, 
leaving the colonialism behind. The British Empire began with a gigantic famine of 1770. It ended with a gigantic famine of 1943, which as a child I actually witnessed because it was all around me in Bengal. There was no famine since then. Uh, there were many other achievements, but something went deeply wrong. And those who look for inequality in Gini coefficient and so on would say, look, what are you grumbling about? The inequality level is not so high in India, and indeed so. There was a little statistical folly in that, because Indians had expenditure inequality, whereas all countries like China, Brazil, Russia, and others compared with that um, uh, had income inequality. Anyone who was involved with this kind of economics knows that inequality in expenditure tends to be less than in income. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. If you're interested, we can discuss it. But then when you correct it, now we have actually income inequality figures, reasonable one. And uh, it's, it's higher than we thought. But on the other hand, it's not higher than in China. It's about the same. The Chinese inequality has grown over this year of huge progress, so has India's. The Chinese have grown a little bit more than India's. But then, what's the problem? I mean, India was growing almost as fast as China. Its inequality level was not higher than that of China. It wasn't increasing faster than China. So what went wrong? Now, if there's a, an example we needed to think about how to think about development, this was a major issue. I think there are two central themes in the Indian uh, development story today. One is the importance of development, and, in the, and the second is the connection between development and growth. I'll come to the second later, but now the first. I think the idea that you can judge all this in the space of income overlooks an enormous number of things. Of course, at a very basic level, it uh, leaves out the vulnerability of people, whether natural or socially created, epidemiological. But related to that, of course, is the role of the state. Not, not often recognize how much of the increase in life expectancy in Europe took place with really a, a very active state action, you know, from epidemiology to healthcare to nutrition, even these school meal programs that India is doing, you know, Europe was the country to invent it. And, of course, they were enormously successful in that. So there was a kind of focus on public services, which somehow missed out. Now, in India, since there's a, the country is full of grumble that too much money is spent on, on social services, you again hear in, again and again that India was a socialist economy, and a lot of people have never forgiven the fact that India had moved it away. But, you know, that is very peculiar. I think the socialist economy is like... Russia and China had all kinds of economic problems. But one problem they didn't have is illiteracy. It's like one of the things when a, a great Indian poet, Govindranath Tagore, went to Russia and he, in 1931, and he sub published a book called Russia City and in Bengal. In English it was Letters from Russia, which of course the English, the British immediately banned. And oddly enough, the ban wasn't lifted until independence. But there he was saying, he raised, uh, it, was quite a, it was quite an interesting thing to read, actually, the, talking about the Soviet Union. He, on one side, said that you know, it was so dramatic to see educational expansion, even way down in, in, in Soviet Asia. Uh, and today, even if you look at the numbers in that part of the world, you can see which had been part of that commitment which is exactly the same commitment that the Chinese also had. But of course, they also had many other things. And Tagore also he gave an interview to Izvestia, and where he asked, saying that, look, you're doing lots of good things, but you seem to not allow people to speak. This is shortly after the trials and the, and the, and the, and the purges, shortly before the trials uh, and purges. But he was already saying that this is, you have to examine that if you 
really doing so many good things. What are you afraid of? Why do you have so much censorship? And so on. Of course, this last year didn't publish it. To be exact, they did publish it, but not in 1931, but in 1967. But of course, the Guardian published it in 31 <laughs> immediately. <laughs> and so there were these two sides which he was noticing. And of course, he wasn't an economist, he wasn't commenting on how counterproductive collective agriculture was. And that, of course, there was an immediate parallel to that in China. Um, so India was allegedly a socialist economy without, um, without some of the things that made at least a superficial appeal to socialism in the form of the Soviet Union China possible, namely a shared uh, a fate about education, a shared fate about healthcare, and so on, none of which absolutely happened. So in some ways, the terminology is quite important. I, I've, I've been spending a little time with the debates in the Constituent Assembly. And uh, uh, one of my students, uh, Anand Gidhada, who actually writes in the New York Times, uh, he gave me a copy of this 14-volume uh, Constituent Assembly papers. And when it came, I thought of it that it would be a showpiece. But I got so engrossed, I was looking through it. And they discussed the issue of terminology. And one of the interesting things, a, a, a great political thinker, then a socialist, later the founder of the free market party, Swatantra, called Minu Masani. And he is speaking there as a socialist very often. Every time he speaks, he begins by saying, as a socialist, I must say, etc. Quite interesting. But there's a remark, he said, we have to be very careful about the word. And he said, for example, fraternity. You know, it, it had such a great origin in the French Revolution. But seeing how the French treated their concept of fraternity shortly following the revolution, when I have to introduce my brother, says uh, Mino Masani, I call him my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think something of that kind happened with <laughs> socialism as well. <laughs> of course, the, so uh, the, it, was, it never went in that direction. In fact, there's a first five-year plan, which is often criticized, for a uh, lot of things like heavy industries and focus on technical education. But of course, the uh, first five-year plan also did the IITs and so on, which really become big success. And something should be acknowledged here. It did it with gigantic American corporation. Namely, MIT was very involved in it. In fact, without them, I think later the role of Silicon Valley is recognized, but the early technical education, they came very much from MIT. So there was a, a kind of global cooperation at that level, but it also discusses basic education. And it decided that basic education is not of much use to the people. What is useful is vocational education. A subject on which it, Incidentally, Karl Marx had spoken rather, rather eloquently about how one's class prejudice is so strong that you can't even think of the workers having any use to do with education, theatre, music, literature, but vocational education. They have to find out how to deliver newspapers door to door. Now, so a first five-year plan did nothing for edu uh, basic education. Uh, they did something with the core basic education. And here I must say we were misled by one of our great leaders, namely Mahatma Gandhi, because he also said that formal education, the three R's, were no use to people. What you need is that they should learn um, these formal education should come to their work. And he recommended, among other things, the charka. And there was a certain debate between, uh, uh, this was taking place in the 30s, between Tagore, whom I referred to, and Gandhi on that. And Tagore wrote back saying, this seemed quite a mistake, because you have to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, and so on. And then he said that uh, about Charka, I've tried that, and it seemed to consist of endlessly rotating the wheel of an antiquated machine with a minimum of imagination and a maximum of boredom. 
and he didn't see how that could be educating anybody. Now, there was a debate, so what happened is that, I think, I don't know what Gandhiji would have done had he been alive, he was dead by then, of course. I think he probably wouldn't have gone along to, with the pro pro uh, proposal of not to have primary education uh, focus. But that was the thing, and that was really even the architects, Mohammed Nubes and, and Nehru all agreed to. So, school education was neglected again and again. My earliest intervention in, on this subject was at that time, in the, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, afterwards, when I was fortunate to get the Nobel, uh, the, one of the Calcutta Paper statesmen published a lot of, of it that I tried to do. And as one of the um, person uh, then said, that, look, I see that in the 50, late 50s and early 60s, you were saying much the same thing. Why is it that your ideas have not evolved? <laughs> so I had to say, well, mainly because the problem remained exactly the same. <laughs> And I'll stop talking about that. Oh, yes, he said, when will you stop talking about the same things? I said, I will, when the problem ceases to exist. So that, the neglect of the basic public services was a kind of gigantic issue. And that continued. The economic policy changed. India's economic growth rate picked up. They also had tremendously counterproductive government policy. The state wasn't doing what it could do and should do well, was doing everything that it could not do well, namely the controlling everything, and controlling everything with a remorselessness which is now hard to imagine. I remember in 63 when I went back to India. How are we doing for time, Christine? Oh, you're good. Okay. Yeah. I, when I went to, um, back to um, uh, uh, Delhi and I... I, I just come from Cambridge, I still had some connections, so I wanted to keep my bank account. So I was told you can't keep a bank account, you have to get the Reserve Bank's permission. So I inquired, I went to the Reserve Bank, and they said, oh, well, of course, you fill up a form, your, your, there will be, uh, your name will be called within coming two or three months, and then you can come and discuss that. So then I was very frustrated, and I mentioned it to um, a common friend who was in the in the government, I.G. Patel, in fact, from you know. And he said, oh, no, no, I have to send you to someone. So I arrived, and since I came with a, uh, with a good introduction, I was invited in to meet this chap. I sat opposite him in the table, and he was talking away with people asking for various permissions. And I could hear only one end of the conversation, and one of them went like this, saying, oh, yes, so you want to go to Canada because your sister is in Canada, and you need some foreign exchange to go to Canada. When did you see your sister last? To which uh, the answer is, that those, you saw her last year. You know, government of India is very keen on sisters, seeing sisters, but once in two or three years, <laughs> <laughs> should be quite adequate. Now, I think that level of intervention, of course, I mean, as a, I, I see myself partly as a libertarian also, despite my left-wing beliefs, because I don't think there is any conflict there. The, I thought the violation of liberty was terrifying, but then, of course, it wasn't very good for industry either. You can't run a business like that. And, of course, that did change in the 92. Not adequately, I think we still need more reform. There's still many more uh, uh, governmental uh, uh, runarounds that you have to do, which you should avoid. And any study of comparison of how quickly you can get a decision between say, China and India will bring out the drama of how quickly it can happen. It's not so much the corruption. Corruption level in China is, I don't think, any less than in India. So I think corruption is a terrible thing and must go. But that's not where the problem really is about the, that, that, that the recent uh, slowdown we have been experiencing. So there was that, so somewhat continuing that, though dramatically reduced under the leadership of Manmohan Singh, led actually originally also by the Prime Minister, who was um, already asked Manmohan Singh to, 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 to become fin finance minister at that time. So that team did something, and the growth rate did go up and so on. But the neglect of basic public services didn't change. And that is actually quite a dramatic contrast 
with what happened nearly every other country in the world. China, Brazil, even Indonesia. As they became richer, they expanded these services enormously in a way that it, India never did. Now, the China, the India spends 1.2 percent of the GDP on governmental health care. China spends 2.7 percent of a much larger GDP. Uh, Brazil spends even higher. India is one of the lowest in the world. So I think the in order, one of the reasons why the penalty of inequality is so high is that the inequality is the inequality aiming is all about income inequality. And that's not a very good way of looking at it. And you, know, you talk about participatory, inclusive growth. But then you have to ask what makes growth inclusive. And here, the focus on income has been a kind of blinding impact. Now, there have been debates and people get upset about whether there should be employment guarantee scheme. Some people point out rightly that there is a lot of waste in that. Others point out also rightly that even looking at the labor statistics, that um, wages have certainly responded. You see, one of the oddities contrast between India and China is that the Indian rural wage has been almost stationary, where the Chinese rural wage has been going at 7% a year. And it's remained competitive despite these rise in wages, which indicates how much productivity was going. But why was the productivity going? Well, they were getting increasingly an educated, more and more educated labor force, and healthier and healthier labor force, which as Adam Smith noted in 1776, is ultimately the major basis of development, the quality of labor. Now, obviously, oddly, that is, of course, where development and growth actually relate, because education and health is extremely important to leading a good human life as well. There's no contrast here. The idea we do growth first, and then we do development later, is really a very odd way of thinking about it, because one of the biggest way of expanding your productive potential is to have an educated, healthy labor force, immunized labor force. People who are not constantly taking leave in order to, because they have some illnesses. And also, kind of um, uh, um, uh, uh, sharp contrast in, in dealing with illnesses. For example, uh, the um, uh, I mean, e even if you contrast it with, let's say, Bangladesh, uh, only about 39% of the Indian population, when faced with uh, diarrhea, which is quite a common kind of gastrointestinal problem, only 39% knows the use of the rural rehydration te technology, whereas Bangladesh is between 80 and 90%. So I think there's a kind of a mismatch of the commitment with, with the work. Now, whenever the commitment has been there, Indian performance has been very good. Like the famine elimination was itself one. The country was absolutely, I mean, famines were associated with, with colonialism. When the world opened itself up, I, all my uncles, as we call them, that's my, well, a brother of my mother and cousins, and my father's cousins, they were all in prison of various kinds. They were called what used to be called um, preventive detention. Not that they had done anything, but they could do something. So in order to prevent them, you kept them in prison. So I went and visited them every now and then, and I wondered why they were in prison as I was moving from six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But um, famine was a commitment that was totally there. And of course, as soon as India became independent, it went there. Well, my commitment comes. Another case which often, sometimes, India doesn't get enough credit is people may remember about six, seven years ago, everyone was saying that India was going to be the great center of the AIDS epidemic. It's going to be number of people with AIDS and HIV think that would be larger than the rest of the world put together. Well, what happened to that? 
Well, basically, it caught the imagination. The newspapers took it up, and the media is very important, which are coming presently. So it depends on what issues you engage in. If you don't diagnose a problem, it won't be solved. And the positive side is if you do diagnose a problem, very likely it will be solved, and certainly resolved to a great extent. And there are many other examples of that kind. Immunization, the standard ones, you don't get any attention. But of course, polio became a big thing. Pakistan continued that in India, didn't become a showcase, and of course, polio could be eliminated. It's not been declared completely gone because you have to wait three years without a polio case before it's seen is gone. I think it's done about two years of that. So whenever there is attention, something happens. But attention is very central. So one of the reasons why the inequality is, the penalty of inequality is so high in India is because the public discourse has not seized how terrible the level of inequality is. Education, health care, immunization, even such small things. 55% of the Indians live in homes without the toilet. Now, I know that open defecation is not a subject that academic universities like discussing. But it is a big problem from a disease point of view. Even today, you can build a house in Delhi and get a permission to build a condominium which, so long as it satisfies the aesthetic requirement, will get a permission without the need for any servants' toilets, even though all of the families have served toilets. Oddly enough, the only place in the only city in India, actually, they're different. Calcutta is a lot better than Delhi, but the best city from that point of view is Chandigarh, mainly because of Corbusier, because that was part of the planning. It indicates how urban design could make a real difference on this kind of issue. But for that, you have to recognize that there is a real problem. Have, were we the first to talk about 55%? Is that India having a higher ratio of open defecation than any other nation in the world? And somebody raised the question and found that Chad had a slightly higher. But that's the only competition. As is this where Ronald Reyes and I first to say no. It came about 10 years ago in National Sample Survey. What happened? There was a certain amount of shocking statement in page 27 in the newspapers. And then it went. So I think um, in order to inequality be solved, we have to recognize inequality to be a really important issue. And it's not just the inequality, and it's not just the question of public services being concerned with employment or, or, or food subsidy, but it's concerned with the basic delivery of those things where a successful government should do. There has been no variation on that. Adam Smith talked about it in 1776. But we haven't caught up with that yet. And that is a gigantic failure, and it's very difficult to get media attention because you immediately deflect it onto, onto that. And I'm not going to comment on, some people here uh, might know that there's been debate going on. I don't know why it's called a debate, because I have to say nothing on the subject. But uh, even if you receive big bats, it is a debate of some kind. But the, the interesting issue is that instead of what is, actually the New York Times review did say that, that to illustrate the point they were making, that the media doesn't like to give it attention, the whole discussion of the book about the pick unflattering portrait of India got completely down on the stories about feud between one economist and another, which was a terrible way to deal with what we are trying to present to the, to the, to the, to the media. So I think the media attention is very important. It's extremely important also to see the role of women as well as men in this context, and that is the Indian consciousness on the women's issue has increased, and particularly after the incident of rape in December 16th last year, there have been a lot of things. I have an article in the, I just was reading it in the car because it's in the New York Review, uh, 
and it, you can't miss it because it's on the cover, uh, and it's uh, it's called uh, uh, mixed fruit. Now let me. I think the outside says truth about the uh, women of India, but inside the title is uh, Indian Women Mixed Suit. And it is a very mixed suit indeed. Uh, I will, I don't have a, I've denied myself a slideshow, so I can't show you the slide, and I didn't know I'll get it on my way to Providence. <laughs> but, um, if you go by sex selective abortion, you know, India's missing women, uh, like China, it used to be large because women were relatively neglected after they're born. When I first wrote about it in 1990, in the same journal, Missing Women in New York Review, that was the reason. But that has come down everywhere. It's not gone, but come down. Both in China and in India, women have a higher life expectancy than men do. And yet, before being born, the sex nat natality discrimination is become, the technique have grown, people can now determine fetuses and they go. But if you take the average picture, you get completely, uh, can, do you think I could um, break the New York with you there? Ah. Uh, I think, uh, Here. I don't know whether people can see that. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> And all these states have law, and indeed there's a gap. I took, we took 935, which is the Irish ratio. And coming off, it's one of the law, you know, to make it very in the way. So, it's 90, so 935 girls being, I don't know whether people know the biology of it, that everywhere more girls, more boys are born than girls. In fact, more boys are conceived than male fetuses are conceived than female. It took me some time when I started work on it. Roughly about a thousand boys are conceived compared with, well, I shouldn't call them boys, male fetuses are conceived and compared with 910 uh, uh, female fetuses. By the time they're born, since uh, women do throughout in the uterus and outside the uterus better than men, given symmetric care, and in the uterus they do get symmetric care, then you tend to have, by the time they're born in, in, in Europe, you get about 940 uh, to, between 935 to 945. The average was 942 for Europe. Now, if you take that cut it off weight and, and take the, the lower one of that, namely, the uh, the um, the island to be sure that if it's below that it must be. So we actually I uh, I didn't use only 935. I actually took lowered it to even 920 and tried to check. Now all these states in the north and the west of India have way below 920, including Haryana 842. Punjab, 854. Gujarat, 891. And compared with um, Kerala, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Assam, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, even Bihar, and Orissa marginally. So, what's the concept? I don't know what this due to. But how does it affect? Well, I think the way women are treated it makes a big difference to economic development. Because one of the questions that we have to ask, on one side there is China. The Chinese ex difference is very easy to explain because the Chinese have been putting, in a classic way, putting much more into public services than India, in every field, without exception. Those who always argue that the Chinese, we have to learn something from China, don't seem to look at the most important lesson from China as to how it en enhances people's lives and how educated, immunized, healthy labor force is terrific for your economic development and growth. But if you look at Bangladesh, it hasn't been spending much more on that. What it did do, partly connected with the, 
with the nature of the uh, political movement that led to the separation of uh, East Pakistan from West Pakistan producing Bangladesh. <laughs> and of course there was a big deal of Bengali nationalism. They went back to well, 16th century, Fullah, Baramasa, etc. That's a story about a woman, poor woman's life, etc. And they, they became a big commitment and so Bangladesh went for basic education, uh, 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 elementary education for girls. Uh, it had a higher ratio of girls than boys in school. In fact, in Bangladesh has a higher ratio of girls to boys than any other country in the world. It became a major commitment. In Bangladesh's um, uh, involvement of labor, of women in labor force, in school teaching, in public services, health care, in family planning, in all of them, is massively more than in India. And you begin to see the impact of it now. I mean, even on the subjects of the toilets I was mentioning, this became an issue. It's, by the way, especially an issue for a woman, because, you know, the idea of open defecation, I'm sorry to discuss these subjects, Christine. <laughs> no. but, but, uh, you know, to go, and that if you mean that you have to go after dark, it's much more dangerous for women than for men. The whole issue, uh, so Bangladesh, not surprisingly, uh, the toiletless households in India is 55%, in Bangladesh is 8%. Um, the, uh, the, in, in all the criteria of wealth, health care, uh, education, and so on, Bangladesh has become much ahead, and life expectancy, Bangladesh used to be three years behind India in 1990. After that, Bangladesh has been growing moderately, whereas India grows ferociously fast. And instead of being only 50% richer than Bangladesh in per capita income then, became 100% richer by now. And yet, it fell behind. Life expectancy was three years behind, Three years ahead, India was, now it's three years behind. Three to four years behind. Infant mortality rate, in every one of these indicators. And here the whole issue about gender justice, like in the case of development, which relates to growth, gender justice also is something which is not only important for women, but also important for the entire performance of the economy, for development profile in general. So I would say that these two factors, and media has to pay more attention to that, rather than be concerned with uh, glitzy things like, um, uh, you know, films and, and others. I don't object to it. I have a film actress or actress daughter who also does theatre. So uh, it's nice to see her picture every now and then, but I think the idea, whole idea that these are the more important issues to deal in India is really a gigantic folly. Similarly, women's issues hardly ever. Now, it got a huge issue on the rape, but it didn't cover it well. For example, I read in the New York Times uh, uh, yesterday saying, well, there are many more things happening in, in, in India, uh, in, in, in Delhi, but other cities, my God, is a problem. But other cities is far less problem than in Delhi. The rate of rape is nine times as high in Delhi as in Calcutta. And I think there are big differences, but these are not media stories. You, you won't get... I mean, one reason why I may be claiming some credit for getting a New York Review without others noticing is because these are standard statistics, but they're not discussed statistics. And this contrast that I'm drawing with on, on, on sex selective abortion also indicates an attitude to women, which is also a contrast. And we have to learn what it is due to. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, there are clear ling language connection between, um, and I won't speculate, between Tamil-based languages and of the Sanskrit languages, the two bifurcations, uh, mainly Magadhi, which is uh, the eastern part, and Saraseni, and it's the Magadhi part that, that, that is on the Tamil side, as opposed to Saraseni. Why? I don't know. 
what should be the kind of connection between language and... I just don't... I do want to work on that. But you have to recognize that problem. So I would say media, general attention to deprivation, the issue of women's equity, these are the ways of making inequality important, and ultimately it's also to make growth stable. Growth is not required for its own sake, but it's really important. And I'm often accused of not having said this, which I must say, I find a bit peculiar since my PhD thesis was on economic growth, and my second book was called Growth Economic. But on top of that, in 1989, when Rod and I wrote our first, this is our seventh book together. First book together, we discussed what we call the growth-mediated security. Why you need growth, but not just for its own sake. So it's that focus which I think would make a difference to the pain of inequality in India. Thank you.